to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense, from culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from and the businesses and more importantly the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Welcome to this week's episode and buckle in because I think it's my favourite genre of podcast where we go on a deep dive of learning of something that I think is going to be important to our shared futures on planet Earth and in today's show perhaps even our one day futures on another planet. As regular listeners will know, I love to learn about where our food comes from and some of the more obscure humans of hospitality who specialise in a particular subject behind the scenes of food and drink. Regular listeners will also know that I've had pretty detailed conversations over the past couple of years on anything from bees to producing cheese to rearing animals to an obsession of perhaps botanicals and booze. And continuing that deep dive philosophy, today's guest is Chris Davies, founder and CEO of Harvest London, a couple of vertical farms in the city of London. And Chris is going to help us understand how vertical farming could be part of the solution to feeding the planet. As Chris puts it, this will be part of the solution. Not all food will be or can be grown this way. But the benefits of growing food where it is to be consumed, rather than potentially thousands of miles away, the benefits of harvesting food and getting it to the restaurant door within four hours, rather than perhaps four weeks, the benefit of a perfect summer's day, every day, no matter the time of year or external weather conditions, all have a potential huge impact. The use of tech and automation and the potential for companies to ship their perfect growing recipe to perhaps tweak just a couple of bits of the growing process to grow the perfect leaf. A little more water, half an hour less light, more blue light than pink light, a slight nutritional change. All of this can affect the flavour of what we grow and ultimately eat. And in Chris's case, much of this learning is being done around basil, but can be applied to so much more. And it is clearly a recipe that is working. Chris and Harvest London have just raised over a million pounds of investment, including from the UK government's future fund, and demand is fast outstripping supply as they have grand plans for the future. I really hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. I hope it sparks a bit of curiosity to continue the adventure with me in speaking to the humans of hospitality every week who continue to work hard for when we can reopen the doors. If you do enjoy the conversation, or even if you just feel like helping me out, can you do me a favour and leave a review and subscribe to the podcast on your player of choice? Leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts is super easy as an example. You can probably pause this show right now Take a look on the device you're listening on and be back here in 60 seconds. And that means the algorithms like the show more. They play it to more people and I can reach out to more guests and convince them to take part. For example, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall's PR team got in touch this week for download figures and I would love to chat to him. So we're all in this together. On that note, thank you to Beth Trev and Kashi74 for your five-star reviews this week. Lovely to have you listening, and thanks for taking the time to feed back. Okay, let's get on with this week's episode and head over to meet Chris. Cheers. Chris Davies, founder and CEO of Harvest London. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Really appreciate you taking the time out. Unfortunately, I was hoping to come up to see you at the farm, but alas, uh, COVID has scuppered that. But for people listening, can you just explain where in the world are you, Chris? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, happy to be here. I am in our small office in our vertical farm in Leighton in East London. Amazing. Okay, good. So you've uh, yeah you made made it into the office. You're pretty much there every day. I guess you know we're in the middle of a pandemic. You can you can come in. You're a yeah. You can't grow stuff like that from home, can you? So you know what's yeah. Time. The, pl- the plants have a way of just keeping growing um, when the lights are on. You know. So um, yeah, we we we've been operating all throughout the pandemic and have been 
um, working with our customers and partners all, all the way through. Um, it's been definitely very challenging, but it's also been kind of great to see how um, we've been able to maintain our, our, our operations and, uh, you know, the few restaurants and, and that we that we do work with um, have actually, you know, are in a fortuitous position that have that have still been operating. Amazing. That's that's awesome news. So we're going to chat all about vertical farming. And I'm, I'm genuinely really excited to sort of dive into this topic because it's something that's come across sort of my bowels on quite a lot of occasions. And I've just been waiting to talk to, to, the, to the right person to, uh, to understand it. So for, for people who've got absolutely no idea of what a vertical farm is, can you just explain to people? Yeah, what, what is it? What are we talking about here? Absolutely. So, um, you know, the technical term for for vertical farming is controlled environment agriculture, right? It it is a flavor of controlled environment agriculture, just like greenhouse growing or glasshouse growing is a flavor of controlled environment agriculture. But fundamentally, vertical farming means that we use hydroponic technology um, and we grow in layers in a warehouse in East London. Um, And the combination of growing under LEDs, the combination of growing in in stacks one on top of the other means that we can produce quite a bit more than traditional agriculture um, while doing it in a very sustainable manner, right? So in our warehouse, in our controlled environment, we control, you know, every aspect of growth, you know, everything from the temperature, the humidity, the light intensity, um, the kinds of nutrients that we give our plants. Um, And it's always a perfect summer day in our farm, uh, you know, so we are able to things grow really, really well. And because we grow indoors, um, we can put our farms very close to where our customers are. Um, You know, the promise that we make to our customers is we go from harvest to delivery in four hours, um, which is obviously a far cry from traditional agriculture where, you know, 85% of the produce in this country comes from outside this country. Um, So it's a real step change in terms of how how food is produced. Yeah, I love it. And we're going to get into some of the, the advantages that offers. Just give me a sense of, of scale and sort of size. I suppose when you talk about greenhouses, you know, I've driven through Holland and seen those, you know, greenhouses that just seem to go yeah, on for yeah. miles and miles and miles. But how big are your sort of operations? Because you, you can, in essence, you can start a vertical farm in something as small as a container, can't you? And you can go bigger. What, what sort of size are yours? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we started off in a something not smaller, not bigger than a container. Um, we've... Um, grown to about 3,000 square feet um, in terms of growing space. Um, And that's producing about, you know, I would say about five to six tons of produce every year. Um, And, you know, we do that with really kind of two, three people. Um, um, And, you know, we employ a lot of automation that allows us to to do that. Um, Yeah, and we work with some of London's, um, you know, very well-known kind of pizza restaurants um, and transform the sustainability of their supply chain by by growing their basil more locally yeah. in Italy. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, so 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 five to it's, it's sort of five to seven tons. You've got two locations. Am I right in saying that now? And is the second location is that quite a bit bigger than the first one? Or? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so you know the the first location was kind of has become like a test facility. Um, but the, the main location that we produce out of is, uh, definitely a lot bigger. So, you know, we're a startup, we're still a small company in the grand scale of kind of vertical farming, as you rightly pointed out, you know, glass houses are, you know, hectares and hectares vertical, the largest vertical farms in the world are, you know, a hundred thousand square feet of growing space, right? We're in this kind of 3000 square feet, but we've experienced a lot of growth in the last year, despite COVID. Um, and we're, we're in the planning stages for building a 50,000 square foot vertical farm at the moment, um, you know, pending a lot of um, conversations with new customers and funding bodies and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, amazing. So when you talk about sort of fast growth, that's, that's an understatement in some ways, isn't it? So you raised 400 grand, I think it was in crowdfunding, 500 grand worth of, of angel investors, you even had some match funding from the government. So I think you're over sort of a million quids worth of investment. How have you pulled that off as such a young business? You know, is this sort of right place, right time? Are you doing something different to the existing sort of vertical farming sector? What, 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 why is there such a level of interest? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we were definitely in the right place at the right time. You know, we're in this kind of I, I, what what I always say is that we're enjoying this kind of second wave of vertical farming. Um, you know, when when kind of vertical farming first started, kind of eight, nine, ten years ago, um, a lot of those farms that were operating back then have since failed, and they've all pivoted to becoming hardware companies. 
um, you know, providing, you know, buying the, you know, providing the hardware that someone like me can buy to build my own vertical farm. Um, really, those farms have all failed because of kind of um, the challenges of LED lights back then, right? So LED lights is one of the key determining factors for the success of a vertical farm because of how much energy it takes. Um, but, you know, LED lights are getting, uh, you know, almost 50% more efficient every year. Um, so what that means is that, you know, they're cheaper to run, but they also don't produce anywhere near as much heat as they used to, which means that the environment around the LED lights are a lot, are a lot easier to control. Um, you know, we, we have been, when we started Harvest London with me and my, my business partner, we were kind of deep in Brexit territory, right? We were, we were, that was back in 2017. Um, and I couldn't figure out why. You know, we were going through this process of Brexit and at the same time, um, the recognition that 85 percent of the produce that we consume here is from the EU and further afield. So why aren't we you know, doing something? Why is, is an island nation like the UK not more into vertical farming? Um, you know, if you think about the leaders in the space globally, right, the Japanese are very big into this. The Singaporeans are very big into this. Um, the Americans, obviously, with Silicon Valley. Um, and I couldn't quite get it. You know, there was one other vertical farming company you might have heard of growing underground. Um, you know, they have they were all over the news a while back because of, you know, where they grow, which is, you know, in, in kind of World War II tunnels underneath Clapham South Station. But they were really the only kind of people that were doing it back in kind of 2017, 2016. Um, so we started the business then. Um, and we really kind of started off um, by differentiating ourselves from from some of those competitors. So we, we were so small that we couldn't work with uh, the groceries. We couldn't work with large retails. We had to start with chefs. Um, so in our in our first farm, which was really kind of a proof of concept, um, you know, so my business partner um, is a plant biologist, knows everything about growing plants, luckily, because uh, when I started this, I knew nothing about it. Um, but, you know, we just started a small farm in, you know, not much bigger than a container in, in Walthamstow in London. And um, we very quickly learned that, you know, we can grow actually some very, very good produce Um and we started servicing, you know, one or two kind of small but very good restaurants in kind of that North London area. Um, and we hit production capacity very quickly. I think we hit production capacity um, in in about three months. Um, and the whole thinking was that, you know, once we hit production capacity, that was a signal to us to be like, you know, because we were literally turning customers away. Like we would love to work with you, but we just can't produce enough because of how small our our um, facility was. So that was a, a good signal to kind of go to the market and say, hey, guys, we're having to turn customers away. Um, will you give us a bit more money so that we can um, increase our production capacity? So, um, you know, Brexit was, you know, the story of Brexit was really good for us because of the story that I just mentioned. But, you know, COVID is also you know, we're in this kind of fortuitous position where COVID is also relatively good for us because, you know, we've all experienced, you know, fluctuations in supply chain. We've all experienced supply chains breaking down and, you know, shelves being empty. And that's because of this totally global food system that we as a human race have created, right? Where it's cheaper to grow stuff in Italy and ship it over than it is to um, grow it locally um, and, and and consume it locally, right? So <clears throat> the way that I think about kind of vertical farming is it's really about breaking the dichotomy between sustainability and choice, right? B through vertical farming, you can have near limitless choice in terms of what you can have as an ingredient. If you're a chef, you know, you're not limited to what can be grown in this country. Um, at the same time, it's grown sustainably. Right. So um, you can have unlimited choice, not at the expense of of sustainability. Amazing. So I'm really looking forward and we'll come to this shortly about sort of you know energy usage and how you do it, I suppose, and, and yeah. some of those sustainability credentials. So I'm interested, I guess, as to why, because people can buy, you know, it's predominantly basil, I think you grow, isn't it, at the moment? And people can, you know, buy basil. There wasn't particularly a, a shorter budget of it. It's not particularly expensive. What story, the customers you're aiming at, those sort of central London, I guess, restaurants, if that's your target market, 
what's the key part of the story that means they want to flip to buying you? Is is it access and sort of supply issues, or is it more just the story around sustainability and some of those benefits of vertical farming? Yeah, it, you know, it's a bit of both, right? So um, let me tell you, you know, our biggest customer um, is a pizza restaurant, pizza chain called Pizza Pilgrims. Um, and historically, they would buy all of their basil from, uh, you know, special DOP designation basil from the hills of Liguria. Um, and they loved that, right? But they would only get that three months of the year. They would work with a wholesaler and the wholesaler would bring it in three months of the year. The remaining nine months of the year, because that's, you know, basil only grows in Liguria three months of the year. Um, the remaining nine months, it usually comes from either Israel or Egypt. Um, the way that we won that deal is we actually made them do a blind taste test of our basil versus their existing basil. And because we go from harvest to delivery in four hours, we were very confident that we were going to win. And we did. Um, so we proved to them that not only is there a that there is a significant quality improvement um, driven by local food production um, at the same time, by transitioning their supply chain to a more local one we are saving them at least 150,000 food miles per year, right? So that kind of additional um, access to data, the kind of additional um, analysis that we provide our customers about the actual quantifiable benefit of local food production is something that we're very, we're very keen on continuing to, um, continuing to, pr pr to provide our customers. Um, the way that we talk to our customers is it's really about control over their supply chain. Um, so what I mean by that is, as I said, with pizza programs, you know, they would work with a wholesaler and they would essentially take what they were given, right? As long as they knew, yes, it came from Italy three months of the year, it comes from Israel and Egypt, which isn't great, but we're happy with, they would just take the basil that they were given from the wholesaler. And that's the kind of choice. They didn't really have much choice. They worked with the best wholesaler in London and that's what, that's what they would take. We kind of flipped that model on its head. So we grew nine different kinds of basil for them to start. All Italian, all different kinds of Italian basil, but all Italian basil. And we engaged in this menu planning process with them. We, we went to their menu planning day. We sat down with all of their chefs. We sat down with their founders and managing directors. And we tried nine different pizzas with nine different kinds of basil. And they scored it on, you know, how it burns, how it tastes, the oil content, all of these different kind of criteria until we got to the perfect kind of basil for them that they absolutely loved. You know, the perfect right shape, the size, the cupping of the basil leaf. Um, and then that's what we grew for them, right? So we're essentially giving them more control over something. We, we were asking them questions that they, didn't, that they weren't getting asked before about, you know, what kind of basil do you actually want rather than just taking the kind of basil that you were given by, you know, what is a, a very good wholesaler. Amazing. So I, I find it incredible that you, that you can do that. I find it incredible, actually, because, you, you, you know, when we think about other products, I suppose if we think about wine or we think about coffee, we, we imagine, you know, the environment it's grown in and we imagine all the sort of the nuances, I suppose, of the water supply and the soil and which way the hill faces and, you know, whether it's early morning sunshine or late evening sunshine, you know, all, all of these things affect certainly the quality of grapes. And, and, and when we go to these sort of specialized areas for growing, that's what we imagine. Are you saying that all of that basically can be recreated in a, in a warehouse in London. I, I mean, there's a lot more to that. I think it, for, for things like grapes, I think, you know, when you talk about terroir and all of that kind of stuff, um, it definitely, it seems to play a bigger part, but that is one of the challenges that vertical farmers kind of face is like, does the microbiome that exists within soil actually have a significant impact on taste. Um, what we find, and I think where a lot of research in the plant sciences side goes into it, is, is predominantly the impact of light, right? So um, one of the first facts that really got me into vertical farming and got me to the point where I couldn't get it out of my head and I needed to start a vertical farming company was this research that was being done out of MIT in, in the States, where they discovered that if you grow basil under more blue light than red light, so plants only consume blue and red light spectrum, right? Which is if you which is why if you go into a glass house or you go into, you know, a vertical farm, they're usually bathed in this pink light because it's a combination of blue and red bulbs because that's all that plants need. 
So if you create a white light, you're just essentially wasting energy, right? But if you grow basil under more blue light than red light, what you end up producing is a spicier basil. So by controlling the environment in very specific ways, you're fundamentally getting into the realms of GMO without it being GMO. Um, you're getting into the realms of designer produce by it, by ne- by encouraging the natural mutations in a plant. You can encourage the increased production of specific chemicals, specific flavonoids that has a massive impact on um, the taste and the eventual outcome of the of, of that plant. I love that, right? And and, and it, it sends me off in so many uh, questions, I suppose. So. Yeah, I, and and I guess because all of this has got to be balanced with environment, so we've got to come back back to environment in a minute because I'm I'm really interested, particularly around sort of yeah the light colours and stuff. But just to stay on on sort of taste, can you also control? So I guess the you know the other thing that would have an impact is the nutrients that a plant consumes. But I'm also thinking of the ultimate nutritional value of what you're eating as well. So as well as taste, you know, are you measuring all of this data? Can you literally analyze whether, you know, a plant grown under the sun and a, and a plant grown indoors has the same sort of nutritional benefit? Because I'm thinking like when, when we learned about vitamins and we started to extract, say, vitamin C from an orange, what we worked out is actually you can take as many vitamin C tablets as you want, but the complexity of whatever <laughs> the micronutrients are in an orange, I mean, an orange is always going to be better for you than a vitamin C tablet. Can you get into that level of detail, I suppose, of analyzing, yeah, the the nutritional composition of what you're growing as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's where the industry as a whole is going. Um, We are starting to do that. We're not quite there yet, um, although we are starting to do that. Um, Not only are we measuring, not only are we starting to measure the nutritional benefits, we're also starting to measure the being able to fingerprint the flavors in particular foods. Um, so if so, we know that, for example, there are three or four specific flavonoids within basil that gives basil its taste, right? It gives basil that anise flavor. It gives basil the spiciness. It gives basil that pungency. So what we're actually trying to do right now is almost challenge that concept, which is, you know, not... So basil, you know, um, predominantly a warm weather crop, what we're actually trying to do quantify is quantify the benefit, quantify the, the flavor of basil that we have just picked versus basil that was picked four weeks ago, right? Or three weeks ago or two weeks ago. So that you're also quantifying the flavor impact of the supply chain, right? Because so yes, you, you know, just like, you know, if, if, a, if a bit of food has been in the supply chain for four weeks, then the natural implication of that is that it is kind of less fresh, but also less nutrition, right? We kind of associate ne- less nutri- um yeah, less nutritional. So we kind of associate flavor and great flavor with great nutrition, right? Because that's how we've developed as a human race. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of research happening on kind of the, there's a lot of research that's happening on the nutrition side, a lot of research that's happening on the flavor side, but within the context of not just of that food itself, but the, the life cycle that that bit of food has gone through, right? It's, it's great that we can test the flavor of the basil that we have or are grown within four hours of delivery, but we then need to compare that to, you know, what is the flavor profile of the basil grown in Liguria plus, and then also measure the basil flavor of the, the the fingerprint, the basil grown in Liguria. And then once it's landed in the UK, test that basil again. How has traveling for thousands of miles over thousands of hours impacted the flavors of that crop? Yeah, I love it. And this is why I love having these conversations, right? Because there's always somebody who will take their their niche to an extreme, uh, <laughs> which is why I love hospitality. It's just full of crazy people who just, yeah, who think about that. Because you're right, it, it's absolutely true. And I remember when I did an interview with Lavastook Farm and we were chatting about, you know, how you create incredible mozzarella and actually you know it got down to i think at one point there was maybe 11 different sort of types of grass and herbs that the buffalo were eating and then they worked out that actually if they only ate nine of them and i can't remember which ones they pulled out but ultimately it it changed the flavor profile of the mozzarella produced at the other end and you're like oh my god who's got time to actually do that analysis and keep adding (laughs) adding a herb and taking away a herb from a diet so i love that Um, let me tell you my one of my favorite kind of topics at the moment which is really the concept of seed breeding right so um, 
we've again we've created this food system where 95% of the world's seed bank or 95% of the world's seed supply is controlled by four companies you know controlled by the bayers the monsantos the dow chemicals right and that you know that's inherently a broken system but um there's a company run by Dan Barber um of Blue Hill Farm fame um and it's a company called Row 7 Seeds um and essentially he's been he's flipped this model on its head so he's asked his his partner seed breeders to start breeding seeds but only breed for taste if you think about the seeds that we all use that farmers all use they're all designed for outdoor use right so they're designed to be climate resistant they're designed to be frost resistant they're designed to be pest resistant they're designed to be very uniform in shape and very uniform in color because you know apparently we don't like wonky vegetables so those are the pressures that traditional seed breeders have been put under that you need to select for those variables but Dan Barber and his company at Row 7 which I absolutely love and and look up to um He's asked the seed breeders, I don't care what the thing looks like. I don't care that it's going to be pest resistant. I only want you to select for taste. I only want you to go through a traditional seed breeding program, but only select for taste. Yeah. So if if the seed doesn't need to spend its energy on being pest resistant, on being frost resistant, what else can that seed use its energy on? And that's an incredibly interesting question, right? Yeah. Um you know one of the things that they grow is a you know a beet um and they've actually bred out um you know um you know some of the flavors of beets to the point where you couldn't tell that you were eating a beet anymore right and then they actually had to bring back some of that flavor or, or breed back some of that flavor so you could actually identify what this thing that you were eating was which is really fascinating mm. Yeah, it's amazing, and I, I suppose all the way through that, because you know, I get I get really interested. I suppose in you know, feeding the world is, you know, taste is brilliant, and we're such a lucky, I think, as a species to really appreciate taste. Uh, and especially if you work in the world of you know, sort of restaurants and hospitality, and people will pay for good chefs to you know enhance and bring out the flavors of those. But we've also got this nutritional aspect, I suppose that, and I can't help but feel that that you know those heritage kind of seeds will, will have you know more nutrient kind of density mm-hmm. and micronutrients that are going yeah. to be better for you but just just to go back to that question you mentioned obviously too early for you guys to be doing this research but in that early research that is being do it is being done that's looking at the sort of you know the, the nutrient as well as the flavor aspect of of indoor farming what what are those early signs is, is there an indication that you're still getting that kind of uh, density is it, or it is it inconclusive yet or is it one way or the other or from a, so we've focused on we have not focused on the nutrition in the short term we focused on flavor um, yeah. and we know that for example in basil in particular you know there's a reason why we can buy basil in pots in Sainsbury's or Tesco or wherever right and that's because um, basil once you pick it it loses a lot of its pungency it loses a lot of its flavor it loses a lot of the strength of, of the, the actual herb so you know we know that for basil in particular, the flavor profile of fresh basil is much, much higher than traditional, um, that, or sorry, than basil that has been that has been in the supply chain for a while, right? So, um, and that's the kind of research that we're, we're continuing to do. Okay, but it, it, are you aware of any research from others that are looking at the nutritional aspect, or not yet? Too early. Um, I know that the research is being done, but nothing has, as far as I can tell, there hasn't been much research or nothing has been kind of uh, conclusively decided on. Um, the idea the idea being that, um, you know, local and fresh has a natural implication on nutrition, right? The, the more local, the more fresh your production and your consumption can be, the more nutritional that that is for you. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So, going to explore then a little bit of this environmental angle. And I found it fascinating. I was trying to think of the way of wording the question, and I sort of know what I meant in in my head. And, and now it's interesting that you've already talked about red and blue light because I was trying to think of yeah, how can this be 
you know, energy efficient. Because fundamentally, you know, plants are great, aren't they? They take energy from the sun, obviously, when it's there. And there's some downsides, particularly in the UK, because it's often <laughs> not there. But in essence, you need to be taking, you know, en- energy and uh, to, to grow these plants. And, and I, I suppose at what point is there some sort of balance? You know, if I'm, I'm thinking, I guess, if you take solar energy, for example, and you take that energy and you store it in a battery, and then you you, you turn that energy into powering an LED light. And, it, and I love what you just said, that if the, if the LED light is only maybe red and green you don't need to take all of that energy can you get to the point when you're sort of your energy neutral or actually can you can you absorb more energy from the sun and when you convert it into only the lights that you need are you actually almost in a positive position does that make sense you you've yeah, probably that, spent that, more time thinking about this than i have but no absolutely that, that does make sense so i i guess the the first thing to to kind of state is there isn't a lack of energy right um what's lacking is the infrastructure to collect that energy Right. So I think what, you know, I, 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 I might get this statistic wrong, but I think if you use 10, if you use 2% of, of land and cover of the world's land and cover that in solar panels, you'll produce all the energy that we as a human race need. Right. So it's not about the lack of energy. It's about just the lack of infrastructure to collect that energy, which we're obviously as a human race moving towards having more and more renewable sources. So, um, but for us, you know, we already use 100% renewable energy um, for our current farm. Um, you're absolutely right that energy. So energy for vertical farms is our it's a, it's our single biggest cost, right? Um, renewable energy doing that is kind of a first step, a short term strategy for doing that for for achieving kind of more sustainable food production. But the m- medium to longer term strategy is thinking more holistically about power generation and power storage. Um, So for example, right, one of the strategies that we do today, um, we use use renewable energy and the nighttime for our farm is between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. That's because energy is most expensive between those hours. Now the plant doesn't really care when nighttime is as long as there is a nighttime they can transpire and do all of the you know biological processes that they need to do at nighttime so so we're saving energy in that's one way in which we're saving energy but longer term um you know i mean when you when you talk to a lot of kind of finance people and funding people um you know they always throw around the concept of oh you know there's a lot of money being thrown around and there's a lot of money in the market um i would like to see that proven in a very particular way what i mean by that is if you think about power generation and power storage more holistically where you imagine a vertical farm being on the same site as an anaerobic digester being on the same site as a solar farm, then you've created this circular vision of power generation and power storage. So a vertical farm produces a lot of beautiful produce. It also produces a lot of organic waste. Um, It also consumes, you know, um, CO2. So if you take the organic waste that you generate from a farm, and you stick it in an anaerobic digester, the anaerobic digester will produce heat, power, and CO2, three things that can be pumped back into the farm, right? So by thinking more holistically about the infrastructure that exists around power generation, power storage, and food production, you can create an incredibly sustainable food production system. Yeah, amazing. So it feels like we started that journey because e- even with renewable energy, and and I appreciate the complexity because you know as soon as you, as soon as you've got a patch of land and you're growing, you know it's not just about the energy uses; it's also about you know chemicals and fertilizers, and it's the tractor that goes up and down, and then it's you know it's cutting it and it's transporting it and stuff. So, so to just focus on the energy used is, uh, yeah, I, I suppose is is underestimating the the rest of the environmental impact. But yeah, can't can't help but feel the sort of need to understand that. Um, you know, by heating and, and and creating this light and stuff compared to uh, just a plot of land and, and the natural sun. Has there been any kind of analysis, I suppose, if you look at everything else, if you look at that that fertilizer and all the other kind of impact, are you are you definitely more environmentally 
sort of friendly doing it your way or is it actually is it about you know is it pretty much a balance at the moment but the trajectory is if we can you know it's early stage and if we get the hang of this we you know it can definitely ultimately be better where are we at in that in that sort of a uh, seesaw i suppose yeah absolutely i mean you're, you 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 touched on a very important word there which is balance right so the way and and um i mentioned the concept of food miles earlier um but food miles is an imperfect measure right because if you think about how were those food miles accrued? Were they accrued by a truck? Were they accrued by a plane? Where did the food miles come from? You know, how, how, and, and this is the food system that we've created. We've created a very opaque food system where you don't actually know what food, so food mileage is an imperfect measure. So what you really need to be looking at is um, an energy balance. So what is the cost of growing basil in a warehouse in East London versus the cost of growing it outdoors in the hills of Italy plus shipping, right? And then you start to recognize actually, okay, one's better than the other. So that's the kind of um, economics that um, vertical farms are starting to think about and starting to compare and starting to know more about. But we, we face an uphill struggle because it's very hard to understand, you know, one person, one company's supply chain is totally different from another person's supply chain and it's very hard to actually get information out of a lot of these companies and to get to you know very specific numbers but vertical farming as you rightly pointed out vertical farming addresses a whole bunch of other challenges that traditional agriculture faces um so in the same amount of space um we can produce hundreds of times the amount of produce as traditional agriculture and we do that with 95% less water, 95% less fertilizer, and we're 100% pesticide free, right? So, you know, the challenges around soil degradation, the challenges around chemical runoff, the challenge about water shortages um, are all to some extent addressed by converting to a a, a means of production like vertical farming you know by 2050 we're going to have 10 billion people on the planet and we're going to need to increase the production capability of the planet by 70 percent now we're not going to be able to do that using traditional agriculture just with traditional agriculture now vertical farming isn't the be all and end all but it is part of an ecosystem of new ways of growing that allows us to maintain production while also being able to address problems like water shortage, soil degradation, access, et cetera. Okay. So what can we grow then? You know, I'm thinking about, yeah, how, how you're part of that solution. Clearly, uh, I love basil, but I don't want to it. <laughs> so um, what, what sort of things, you know, is, is there a certain type of food, I suppose, that lends itself Absolutely. to working? And, and yeah, what sort of things ultimately are we going to grow in this sort of style? I suppose? So, so historically, the domain of vertical farming is really kind of the herbs and green leafy vegetables, right? Um, this is also an area where there is a lot of research being done. You know, no one's ever going to solve world hunger by growing lettuce, right? Um, until you can grow things like the, the, you know, the starchy root crops, right? Until you can grow things like, um, potatoes and yams and sweet potatoes and that sort of thing. That's the kind of stuff that will, will, will solve world hunger, right? Um, vertical farm. And now a lot of research is being done in being able to grow, potatoes in a hydroponic environment um right um so it, it is going in that direction but at the moment we really kind of focus on herbs green leafy vegetables and we're also moving into the fruit and vines right so the tomatoes cucumbers aubergines um yeah that's kind of those are our, our, our three key areas so herbs leafy greens and um fruit and vines you know if you think about i mean think about you know, if you if we walk into a grocery, there's probably, I don't know, 30 different kinds of, you know, produce that we can buy. Um, you know, we've grown over 100 different things in our controlled environment. A lot of weird and wonderful Southeast Asian herbs, a lot of weird and wonderful Mexican herbs, stuff that, to be perfectly honest, I had never tasted before. Um, and you can't get in this country at all because one, they're just maybe not enough of a market for it, or they wouldn't survive the supply chain of being, of importing it from Thailand or importing it from Mexico. 
So um, we focus on that stuff that we have to import, right? We're not growing, um, you know, the stuff that we can grow in this country because it kind of almost negates the the benefit to a certain extent, right? So we focus on this. We, we've all grown up with cosmopolitan tastes. We all want the coriander that's in the Mexican burrito. We all want the Thai basil that's in the curry. Um, so that's not the cosmopolitan taste isn't going to change, right? This is about giving us access to all of the ingredients that we are already used to, but doing that in a more local, sustainable manner. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it's great, and I just want to touch on something you said then because this this comes up fairly frequently. I think you mentioned a uh, guy, Sing Watson, who's been on the podcast previously before we started this chat. You Big fan. Yeah, he's really interesting, isn't he? And. Uh, I was interested to sort of hear his sort of take because he ended up opening uh, a farm in, I think it was France, either France or Spain, but I think it was France. Um, because he had this challenge, although he supports, you know, organic and he supports local as much as possible. But this debate that actually, you know, is, is it, are you better off growing, I think tomatoes was the one he was chatting about, are you better off growing tomatoes down in the med where there is loads of sunshine and then trucking them up to the UK than certainly in, in Holland at the moment, you know, it's a lot of heated greenhouses are being used so at the moment the energy balance seems to be you know the wrong way and actually yeah sometimes there is an argument as you say food food miles sometimes might be better than than energy used Mm -hmm. it depends i'm also sort of probably two questions here i'm thinking of a sort of some sort of hybrid model i suppose because presumably you 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 know you've got no windows and i'm thinking things like tomatoes and you know is there an argument that you end up with a hybrid that that uh, you know you have got glass so when the sun's energy is there and it's easy to use it you can but then when it's not you can sort of i don't know darken the windows and switch Switch on some gizmos and you go back to a sort of an artificial system. So, yeah, two questions: Is there a hybrid solution? And and realistically, how far away are we from making things like vines and the amount of the extra energy they require from sort of being sustainable to do that in, indoors? Uh, I mean, yeah, that you know that happens that happens already, right? So the, the the you're 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 talking about the difference between vertical farming and glass house growing, right? Um, you know, the fact that we grow in layers, one on top of the other means that we have to use LEDs, right? So the hybrid approach that you talk about is glass house growing, right? Because you're you're grown on a single layer and therefore the sun can reach all the different plants. In our in our bottommost layer, if we created a if we created a glass house in a, a, a vertical glass house, we the, the the sun would never reach the bottommost layer of our crops, right? So um, vertical farming almost assumes that you need the LEDs. Now, you know, places like Planet Earth, places like, as you've read, mentioned in, in the Netherlands, they all supplement their light, their glass houses with LEDs um, because of the intensity that, that you know, they, they also don't get that much sun. Um, and plants can actually handle a lot more sun, right, can handle a lot more light. Right, so the lights on in in my farm are on sixteen hours a day, because one that allows us to grow things much much faster and grow more of it, um, and you know, because and, and the plants can handle that. You know, not all plants can handle that much light. Um, lettuce actually loves that much light. You know, lettuce can handle twenty two hours of daylight. Um, they only need two hours of 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 nighttime. Um, so it depends on the crop. Um, but you know, we're, but the difference between glass house growing and vertical farming is fundamentally, you know, the, the verticality side of things, right? Which is by putting things in a vertical plane, we are, we have less of a footprint. Therefore we can put our farms closer to our customers, right? Now, so, and this is why I, I don't think that vertical farming is the be all and end all. There is always going to be a place for glass house growing. There's always going to be a place for traditional agriculture, but there's also always going to, I think there's also always going to be a place for vertical farming. And it depends on what we, you know, it just depends on sometimes depends on what the crop is. Now we all know from, you know, as you said, from, you know, Dutch greenhouses and places like Thanet Earth and all of that kind of stuff that, you know, tomatoes grow really, really well in a glass house, right? Um, and you can know, you can improve the flavor of those tomatoes by giving it more light, um, which is what they all do, right? They supplement the sun at night. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever driven by Planet Earth at night, but um, just glowing this crazy pink. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, amazing. So when you, when you talk about you sort of starting to experiment, right? You you can grow tomatoes and that's a great explanation so i completely appreciate that and get it and uh yeah so but you can grow things like tomatoes other vines in a vertical farm as well as in a glass house but i'm presuming maybe you do you tend to do more of the um sort of you know the, the cherry toms the sort of smaller kind of side of it is that the sort of stuff that, that will lend itself to vertical farms rather than the big greenhouses yeah that, that that's absolutely right um you know and and it's to do with the the, the verticality right so our we grow one on top of the other um and you know, some tomato varieties are obviously get quite big, right? So they get quite high and get quite tall. Um, so we choose, um, we will choose the right vining crops that are that is appropriate for our environment. You know, at the moment, we're actually growing, uh, we're not growing any tomatoes at the moment, but we're growing two different kinds of um, Thai chili. Um, and we're also growing a Thai eggplant. Um, and I say eggplant, not aubergine, because it's the kind of eggplant that actually looks like an egg. It's a small, round, white eggplant. Um, and yeah, those and, and those are we've chosen those particular varieties because we know that they don't grow. They, they're bushier rather than tall and therefore can work in our environment. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Makes a lot of sense. And I love the fact that plants, one, one of my questions, actually, you sort of answered it already, is that, yeah, plants do need to sleep at some point so that's quite nice it's uh, I don't know. It feels like a very well you know human or, or animal thing i suppose isn't it that's, but, that's uh, yeah. when they do they appreciate that's, when rest. They do, that's when they do all of their transpiring right so that's when they that's when a lot of moisture leaves the plant and when i said earlier on that um you know we can do vertical uh, we can do the same or hundreds of times the amount of, of produce with 95 percent less water in order to get to that 95 percent less number you have to be collecting the plant transpiration, right? So having a condenser that, you know, having a condenser that collects the plant transpiration when it's nighttime, condenses that water, condenses that moisture and pushes it back into the tank. And that's how we get very, very efficient water usage. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So why does a plant need to get, get rid of the water that's in it only to take it back in again the next day? Why is it doing that? I appreciate we get rid of water because we sweat and stuff, but why is a plant doing that? Am I no, going down you, a rabbit hole too deep? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, is, this is a question for the plant biologists in, in, in the company. Unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Um, I just know that it's a natural um, biological process that they all do, right? So it's the same. Um, I think it, it, I think it's, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I wouldn't want your viewers to quote me on this, <laughs> um, but I think it's to do with so the plant transpiration is around it is to do with how the nutrients are transported to the leaves themselves and then deposited there and then the water escapes you know what even if that's not true Chris, it makes a lot of sense to be honest you've definitely you've definitely blagged your way out of that one a lot better than most people would and i must apologize because i do tend to get a little bit uh, geeky on on a detail every now and again because oh, no, uh, I love I this sort of thing. it's fascinating you know, isn't it? it's, there's yeah. only four of us in the company um yeah. but two of the four are both plant biologists so i ask a lot of these kinds of questions myself <laughs> yeah. and it's great well, being surrounded time, by people I'm, that know this sort of thing yeah, it's lucky I hadn't come up in person because I'd have been there all day, just sat in the uh, yeah sat in the lunchroom going and another thing and another question because I just I just think it's fascinating. Um, actually, and talking of that sort of relative lack of people, so is this is this largely an automated process? I'm thinking like you know I've interviewed brewers and coffee roasters and, mm -hmm. and they fundamentally ultimately they get a recipe and once the computer knows the recipe, it can pretty much you know roast those coffee beans to exactly the right level or it can brew the beer to the right level and it doesn't need as much human involvement. Is this the same? Are there, are there, I'm thinking of a farmer sort of out there you know to, licking his finger and working out which way the wind's coming from <laughs> and the temperature that day and kind of you know having to constantly be out there and caressing and loving these flowers to life. Ultimately, do you kind of like you know you you, you measure your data you add analyze and then you go right this is the way and you press the button and it goes um is, is it to that level of control or is, or is there always some sort of variable that comes out and means yeah. you've got to be on it, it? It, it it's a great question and it's one of my favorite topics and it's a topic that i constantly come up with when i speak to you know potential investors and that sort of thing right um so the best biggest most well-funded vertical farms in the world are doing exactly what you what you've said right so everything from you know the seeding of the trays all the way through to packaging and delivery is fully automated with very little human intervention. 
Um, we are not quite at that stage yet. We have automated certain parts of our farm, but there is still manual intervention in terms of, so for example, all of our climate control is fully automated, right? So I can, I can you know, make it go up one degree in the farm from my phone kind of thing, right? Um, I can change the nutrient mix that the plants in the farm get and that sort of thing. So everything around um, climate control and fertigation is automated. Um, we're not, so we, we also automate things like the seeding process, right? Um, because I don't know if you've ever manually seeded things, it, it takes a long time and you have to be quite precise about the number of seeds and all of this sort of thing. So we've automated certain parts of it. Um, now the, we're, as I said earlier, we're in this planning stages of a 50,000 square foot vertical farm and it's that, you know, there's a reason why most vertical farms in the world that are being built today are at that scale is because it's at that scale, really, that you start to be able to apply all of these different points of automation, right? So being able to automate the seeding process, the transplanting process, the harvesting process, packaging and distribution um, within that process. There's also, so when I talk to investors, I kind of talk that level of automation, which I've just described there, I call that kind of level three automation, which is automating all of the manual processes in, in, in the farm. The next layer up from that in terms of automation is automating the plant science side, right? So right now we are reliant on the plant sciences on the team to say, okay, we're growing under this, let's call it a climate recipe. We're growing basil under this climate recipe. And if we sow 10 grams of basil seed, we will get 10 very, and we know this very precisely, we will get, if we grow 10 grams of basil seed and grow it under this climate, under this humidity, under this nutrient mix, we will very specifically get 10.4 kilos of basil at the end of it. Okay, what if we tweak one of the variables? What if instead of growing the same basil at 27 degrees, we'll grow it at 28 degrees? Oh, we've just increased our yield by 8%. So that side of things is still fully automated, is still fully manual today, but that's where the biggest and best vertical farms are starting to automate. They're also starting to automate the plant science side of things. So if, imagine having you know, a camera pointing straight down at your plants, constantly measuring how they're growing on a you know, hour by hour, minute by minute level, you tweak one of the variables and then you can see the, the natural impact on how things are growing, right? This is a really, really fast, and, and you know, I mentioned that energy is our single biggest cost. Our second biggest cost, as you can imagine, is labor, right? By automating a lot of this, you can offset a lot of that labor cost. In addition to that, um, you know, it's a perfect summer day in our farm, 365 days a year, right? But what it also means is by having human intervention, you're almost increasing the risk in that farm. So our farm is kind of like a combination between a, a farm and a lab, right? So we have, we're not quite as clean as a lab, but we try to keep it as clean as possible. The reason being, if a bug, if a thrip, gets into our farm, it'll spread like wildfire, right? Because there, it's a beautiful day and there are no predators. So by having the human intervention side of things, you're actually increasing the risk of growing. So um, the only way, because we're 100, we're, because we're committed to being 100% pesticide free, the only way to get rid of bugs is by introducing beneficial bugs that can get rid of the pests. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, you're right. I've had some conversations on that. You're literally blowing my mind and I don't know whether to love this or hate it. You know, I just find <laughs> it's so it's so amazing. I mean, it's such a contrast. I did a podcast yesterday where I, I walked around a 138 uh, 30 acre uh, estate of a, of a sort of a country house hotel and we were looking at bees and uh, yeah, creating little bug hotels and, you know, sort of how That's to great. manage nature. Yeah, it was cool. And, and I love it. And then this is like the opposite extreme, isn't it? I feel literally like I'm with Elon Musk sat in Mars and he's talking about, you know, this is how we're going to grow our food. Is this the kind of technology? Technology that ultimately is, is, you know, if we're ever going to leave the planet, this is the kind of way we're going to need to grow our food. 
I mean, it really is. Um, you know, we need to be able to, because it comes down to resource efficiency, right? Um, you know, if you think about, you know, the International Space Station, right? They have a controlled environment, right? They have, they collect everyone's urine and they collect everyone's sweat um, and it gets recirculated so that people can drink it, right? So it comes down to being, to being able to produce as much as you can with as little resource as you have, right? Because, you know, getting a whole bunch of water up the space um, is a very big challenge. <laughs> it really is. Um, but yeah. you're touching on, you know, bees are, is a big topic in our company. Um, you know, we grow aubergines, we grow chilies, flowering, mm -hmm. fruiting plants need a lot of times need to get pollinated, right? Um, not all the time, but depending on what the crop is, they need to get pollinated. Um, so a lot of vertical farms actually introduce bees into the farm temporarily, right? So you stick, a, you stick a, you know, a, you can actually rent beehives, um, yep. stick it in the farm, get them to pollinate everything for a, a finite period of time. At night, they all come back into the hive, you take them out, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this beautiful kind of symbiosis, you know, the only way of um, pollinating, if it's not going to be bees, it's going to be one of our guys using a paintbrush. <laughs> yeah. I've had this conversation, funnily enough, with a beekeeper, and they do like. And, and I know there was a lot of publicity recently in with almond farms and the destruction Indeed, of the yeah. sort of bees and stuff. And yeah, it's fascinating. And, the, and the, those bees don't get zapped on those uh, LED uh, pink lights. Then presumably, I'm slightly okay, worried sorry. about there being a, a bee massacre. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that, right that would be. We would all be horrified by that. <laughs> oh, yeah, like I say, I'm sort of. I'm, I'm. I'm. You're blowing my mind, and I'm loving you and hating you in equal measure. Now, that's actually that's a lie. There's definitely more love. There's more love than hate, Chris. But it is. Uh, yeah, it feels. It feels so sci-fi. So when you talk about the future then then this this 50,000 square meter kind of idea is this to continue to do what you're doing to supply more of the same because you you've very much gone into the um you know to the restaurant and the chef market rather than to either to the supermarkets or direct to the consumer how do you see this panning out you know as you say you've got more demand than you've got supply at the moment which direction are you going to take you know who you're serving yeah um i mean we are trying as hard as we can to not engage with groceries for as long as we can um just because we're too small right we're never going to hit the margins that they hit um and we're probably never going to we're probably not going to hit the quantities that they need but you know they're in a, they're in such a strong position that we almost have no leg to stand on from a negotiation standpoint right um so while there there will absolutely come a time where we will will want to engage with groceries there are almost these kind of rules that we put in place for ourselves such as you know not getting white labeled right i don't want our produce to get sold as you know white labeled produce by that particular supermarket so almost spinning up a brand our own brand to be able to sell is is one of those kind of rules that we put in place for ourselves but we you know there is enough space in the B2B realm, um, because think about all the companies that have a dependency on the food supply chain, right? Think about all your wholesalers, all your restaurants, all your food manufacturers, um, all of wholesalers, all of those kinds of people who, um, you know, still need ingredients, still need high quality produce. And we want to stay in that space for as long as we can. That back and forth that I described with Pizza Pilgrims, where we um, sat down with their chefs and tried nine pizzas with nine different kinds of basil, that was such a cool experience, right? Um, and it's not something we get with, it's not something that we get by selling, um, you know, to groceries. So that we, we kind of call this model like partners by design, right? Which is we want to work in partnership with our customers to give them the absolute best produce that they can get and give them control over that, right? If Pizza Pilgrims overnight were to suddenly change and we're like, oh, we're not a pizza restaurant anymore, we're a Thai restaurant, that means we need Thai basil, not Italian basil. All we'll do is just stop growing Italian basil, right? I, I, you know, Our basil grows in four weeks. So uh, with enough notice, we can be very agile in terms of what we're growing and what we're not growing. Um, everything that we do is grown to order, right? Grown to forecast. Because the idea is that um, we are um, understanding 
consumption, we are understanding the demand and very precisely matching supply to that. Um, if we don't understand that demand bit and we just produce for producing sake, that just ends up resulting in a lot of challenges for the business, not the least of which is waste. Um, so by working in partnership with our customers, um, we're hoping to create a more sustainable, kind of ecologically friendly um, kind of food system. Um, you know, the, the nature of our business as well, right? Because we deliver week on week on week, um, from the very beginning, we're a no single use plastic organization, right? When we deliver our basil to the restaurants, when we deliver our produce to the restaurants, we deliver in these reusable containers. And we just pick up last week's reusable containers um, when we deliver this week's. So that's the kind of back and forth. That's the kind of dynamic that we like creating with our customers. Mm, love it. I think it's brilliant. And so at the minute, then you're delivering directly to the consumer. You've very much got the relationship directly with your customer. You know, can you continue to do that? And, and is this because I, I think there must be, you know, countless and I've spoken to a lot of them, but, you know, I think of, uh, of all the different sort of chefs and restaurateurs and hoteliers that I've spoken to. And I, I can't think of one that, you know, wouldn't go, this is awesome. You know, I, I just love it, particularly. You know, Basil's just such a great example of something that they probably use a lot of and, and those other kind of herbs. So I, I can see demand outstripping supply for quite some time. Do you think you'll continue to do it in that sort of, yeah, you know, d delivering and managing that relationship yourself? And can you see yourselves getting out of London? Because I could see you being very busy, you know, just in London. But I just look in my town and go, look, you know, there's probably 200 hotels and restaurants who would all love a this. You know, I, I suppose it's a bit like the open source thing, isn't it? You almost you know, educating people that this is possible and, and are you expecting other people in, if, if you're solving an environmental problem here, are you almost encouraging other people to go, look, you know, go, go and do this in your neck of the woods or is your ambition to do this nationally? Yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the vision that we have for Harvest Farms is really to create a network of data-driven farms, right? Um, the idea being like, let's say we're in, you know, we're a couple of years from now and we have a farm in London, a farm in Manchester, and I have a farm in Edinburgh, um, and an order comes in from, I don't know, Sheffield, that we should be able to look at production across the entire network and service the customer from the nearest farm, right? Because that's the whole point of this whole thing, right? It's about reduction of food mileage and harvest delivery in four hours. Um, but you're touching on a really interesting point, which is, you know, we've created a system right now where we, we actually ship and transport foodstuffs across the globe. Imagine not having to transport the foodstuff itself, but you just transport the recipe to grow something, right? So if we have a particular recipe for basil, and I know that there's a vertical farm in New Zealand, that doesn't know how to grow basil, all we need to do is trans is inform them of what the, the Harvest London basil recipe is, and then they can do that exactly the same way over there, right? Um, so there's a whole kind of technology side to what we do and how we manage climate recipes and how we um, almost manufacture um, the food that we the, the, the food that we grow so that we're very precise about, you know, um, what it takes to grow these things. But imagine, imagine a world where instead of shipping the actual raw material, all we're shipping is the knowledge to grow that material in another place. Mm. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. <laughs> Amazing. Um, could you see this sort of being a, a, a franchise? But I'm thinking that, you know, again, you've got a few restaurants there, but, you know, you have a Cornwall, a Devon, or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah. could, you, could you see this as a, as a franchise or have you not got that far ahead in your planning? <clears throat> um, yeah, we're not, we're not quite there yet in terms of our planning. I, I, you know, I definitely see the potential of that. Um, I, I definitely see, you know, there's an opportunity. So here, here's, an idea. here's, here's a, um, a quick stat, right? So um, this country imports about 400 million pounds pounds as in money worth of fresh herbs every year right um and you know fresh herbs is a kind of broad definition but it includes things like basil um a 5000 square meter vertical farm which is what we're looking to grow what we're looking to build i mean um represents can grow 1% of that herb requirement. What that means is very broad brush strokes is you can build a hundred 5,000 square meter farms and make the UK self-sufficient when it comes to its herbs. But that's only herbs. What about fresh leafy greens? What about 
um, you know, fruiting vines. So, you know, the food system and the food industry is so large and it's so dependent on this totally globalized model that we've created um, that, you know, when, when a new vertical farming company comes up or a new controlled environment agriculture company comes up, I think it's a great thing, right? Because we're moving, we're all moving in that direction where we're creating a more sustainable, resilient food system for everyone. So you got some money from government uh, future funds, I think, didn't you? Does that mean that the government's on board with this? Do they get it? Is this a problem they want to solve this sort of uh, this food, national food policy, I suppose, and, and access to food and relying less on imports? Is there a motivation from government? To yeah, do this? definitely. You know, as I said earlier, when we started in 2017, I couldn't understand why we weren't doing more of this and why industry wasn't being encouraged by government to do more of this sort of thing. And that's changed in the last, I would say, year, year and a half. Um, so there are a lot of programs, not least of which is the, the, you know, the agriculture bill that came out recently, right? Um, having left the EU, EU farming subsidies are going to end in about seven years, I think, six years. Um, so obviously there needs to be something that, that kind of fills that void, right? Now, the UK is taking a very innovative approach to this in the sense that the farmers that used to rely on EU subsidies will now have to rely on British subsidies. But the way that the government is structuring these subsidies is it's not only to do with your production or the amount of space that you have, it's also to do with what you're doing with that space. So these farmers are being encouraged to rewild a lot of their space which is all well and good, but the farmer itself is also going to need to maintain their production, right? They're not going to rewild everything at the cost of their livelihood, right? So vertical farming, I, I think, is going to, you know, I, th I think a lot of traditional farmers, traditional, um, yeah, traditional farmers are going to have an opportunity to pivot some of their production into vertical farming, therefore being able to rewild some of their land at the same time as maintain their production. Um, you know, if you talk to, I, I speak to the government quite a bit because in the last year or so, we've received a lot of kind of feedback and insight from government, you know, places, you know, companies like Innovate UK, um, driving a lot of funding to encourage companies like mine to kind of push um, and increase our, 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 our capabilities in this space. You know, we're, you know, we like to say that the UK has a strong agricultural tradition, but, you know, I, we absolutely do. But at the same time, we're well behind companies like, or, or co countries like the Netherlands in terms of agricultural production and agricultural advancement. Um, and, but hopefully in the last year or so, um, there's been a real step change in terms of how they see this and, we're going to get more and more support from the government in order to, um, you know, create a more resilient food system. Amazing. Well, look, you know, this is brilliant. And I could probably spend another two hours chatting to you, Chris, but we're <laughs> out of time, which some listeners will be grateful for because they'll think, God, never did I think he could talk an hour on, on, on vertical farm. <laughs> I, reckon I, I reckon I could do another one easily and I reckon you could too. But um, for people who, who are listening and, and from a sort of customer perspective, I suppose, could look, you know, love it. I'd like to buy something. Is, is that an option at the moment? You know, can you can you supply new customers? And, and if you can, is it is it very much London centric? Um, well, um what I would suggest is you um, support your um, local restaurants. Um, you know, we're not, we are London centric, but pizza pilgrims, for example, and this is going to be a quick plug for pizza pilgrims. You know, they've invented the concept of pizza in the post, right? Which is a, a, a total response to COVID, right? It's been great to see how restaurants have kind of pivoted and have got really creative in terms of how, um, they service their customers. So Pizza Pilgrims created Pizza in the Post, which is fundamentally, they'll send you a pizza box of raw pizza ingredients and um, you have a little pizza making party at home, right? Um, which is great fun, you know, especially if you're bored at home. Um, and our basil is in, is in all of those pizza kits. So that's probably the easiest and that's available nationwide. That's probably the easiest way to get our basil. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but if and and me, so a lot of people listening to this actually, you know, have their own uh, restaurants and, and hotels and stuff like that as well. If they want to buy it as a as a sort of you know as, as a restaurateur, I suppose you got capacity for that. Or? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're we're hitting pretty close to manufacturing capacity, actually production capacity. Um, but you know, we're always talking to new customers. We're always talking to people like you and and other restaurateurs. Um, and a lot of it is an education exercise, right? So I I think when we started this conversation, you were asking some very pertinent questions around, you know, does it actually taste better? Is it actually more healthy for you? You know, we love. I mean, this is obviously kind of pre-COVID, but we love having customers and chefs come in and check out the farm and hear more about how we're growing things. And most people actually do kind of leave being like, oh, wow, this is, this, you know, this is actually the real thing and, you know, the, the, the sustainability side. So I would encourage anyone interested in, in reaching out to us to go to our website, um, harvest.london, um, and just check us out there. Perfect. Okay. Uh, you personally, if they want to follow your adventures and journeys, any any particular social media channel that you use, or are they better off just going to uh, Harvest London? Or? Yeah, they're better. I, I'm I'm not I'm not particularly big on social media myself. Um, you know, working in the environment, working in the in the hospitality space, Instagram is all obviously very big. Um, I highly recommend following us on Instagram, Harvest London. Perfect. Okay. Well, I will put some links up to the uh, in the show notes as well that take thank people you, to uh, everything. But look, you know, thank you so much. I I, I was genuinely uh, excited to chat it through. You've um, you've lived up to my very high expectations, Chris. And I just love going on a little a journey of learning, I suppose. Uh, and if I was an investor, I'd invest some cash. I, I can see this <laughs> clearly. Thank you. Uh, it, it's the future of um, yeah, like you say, it's not it's not the solution to everything, but it's clearly going to be such an important part of the the ecosystem around food. But yeah, thanks so much for taking the time, and I wish you the very best of luck uh, as you continue to grow your business well, well hopefully after um after lockdown we'll have you down to the farm and uh, you'll get to see it for yourself i will be there i'll be there thanks for chris appreciate thank it thank you so what do you think inspired genius terrifying fascinating all of the above why not let me know your thoughts head over to humansofhospitality.co.uk and fill in the little contact form on there and get in touch I might be able to share your views in future episodes or it might inspire me on future guests and topics to explore. And whilst you're on the website, sign up for the weekly newsletter. There is a box for that too to pop in your email. No spam, just one simple email per week from me with information on that week's guest and any links to their website, social media and useful information we discuss all in one place and it helps me know who is listening, which is nice. Otherwise, I might think I'm just rattling on to myself each week. So get in touch, say hi, make me smile, and have a great week. I'll be back next Monday morning with a brand new episode. Cheers.